Hello everyone, my name is Hannah and today I will discuss modelling the transport and deposition of ash following a magnitude 7 eruption using the results of a case study from the Mazama Tefra. Here's a quick outline of today's talk. Firstly, I will cover why modelling the ash dispersion following large magnitude eruptions might require some additional care. I'll then briefly introduce why the Mazama eruption was a useful case study for this exercise and I'll present the key findings of the study and finish up with some final remarks. So why can modelling large eruptions be more challenging and are our existing models of ash transport and deposition suitable? So three things must be considered when modelling large magnitude, uh, magnitude 7 or greater eruptions. Firstly, large eruptions are typically characterised by multiple phases of activity, meaning that using a single set of eruption source parameters is often not appropriate. Secondly, because of the very, light, very high mass eruption rates associated with large eruptions, there is significant spreading of ash by gravity currents in the umbrella cloud region. This means that modelling purely advection diffusion is not appropriate and will likely underestimate the extent of the ash dispersion. And finally, because our understanding of magnitude 7 or greater eruptions is primarily based on interpreting the deposits of prehistoric eruptions, there are often large uncertainties in our estimates of eruption source parameters and these will propagate into the uncertainty in model simulation results. This is one of the reasons that using the climactic eruption of Mount Mazama in modern day Oregon is quite useful for studies of large eruptions because of its widespread on-land tephra deposit. This has meant that many authors, including myself, have been able to carry out extensive studies of the tephra deposit um, in order to constrain eruption source parameters such as the volume and the plume height, and also the grain size distribution. Also for, for this study, we focus primarily on the distal deposit, uh, where my previous work, for example, evaluated the reliability of thickness and volume measurements. And we've also been able to observe that in this distal region, the grain size of the deposit remains relatively stable over really large distances, and therefore this simplifies quite a key input parameter for dispersion models. So in this study, we use the Eulerian dispersion model, ASH3D, and this computes tephra transport and deposition over a 3D grid using a time-dependent wind field. So we chose this model because of its capacity to use the time-varying wind field, and also it's been extensively tested and kind of um, calibrated by authors at the, at the USGS. And here I'm just showing some examples of the simulations that the USGS runs daily. So another benefit of using the ASH3D model is that it's been modified to include an approximation of umbrella cloud spreading. And I noted earlier that this is a really important thing when studying large eruptions. So in ASH3D, this has been achieved by calculating the radial winds inside the umbre umbrella cloud um, based on an eruption uh, relationship sorry, between the mass eruption rate and the volume growth rate of the umbrella cloud. Using this relationship, the velocity field within the umbrella cloud is then calculated and can be added to the ambient wind field. So this is shown here in this figure where in the top panel we have the kind of normal way that ASH3D is run and um, with this kind of small plume and then for large eruption scenarios the um, umbrella cloud modification. So you can see in these um, nodes here with the blue arrows we've added these umbrella radi uh, radial umbrella cloud um, velocities to the ambient wind field so it increases the kind of spreading at the source region and this is a figure from Mastin et al. 2014. So for this study, we have now run over 70 simulations using ASH3D um, of the climactic Mazama eruption using the eruption source parameters that I kind of worked on and determined earlier in my PhD research. So our approach was to investigate the influence of individual model parameters and then compare the simulated deposit against our field data. As I said, we have quite a, an extensive database of field observations. So for the purposes of this talk, I'll just focus on a couple of key parameters, but do feel free to contact with me um, if you'd like some more details about the results section of this study. So I'll start by discussing the importance of the diffusion coefficient and the umbrella cloud spreading regime. So these plots are showing ice pack maps of the simulated deposit, so those coloured polygons are the ASH3D model thickness, and then the colour points are corresponding to sites where we have field data so measurements of the primary tephra thickness. For these plots, specifically I'm showing how in panel A, when we don't have any radial umbrella cloud spreading, the Mazama deposit is much more narrow than what we observe on the ground. So that's this deposit that we're showing here. 
And even when we add some horizontal diffusion, so here we're running with an increased horizontal diffusion coefficient, we don't see any uh, closer correspondence to, to the field deposit. And this is unlike what has been seen in smaller eruptions, for example, the Mount St. Helens, when adding horizontal diffusion, we do get quite a good agreement. What we do see, however, is in panels B and C, when we add the umbrella cloud spreading regimes, um, even with different computations, um, we do see that the deposit is much closer to what we'd expect from the field data. So much more off axis spreading and a much wider deposit, for example. And yeah, as I said, the difference between B and C are just kind of di slightly different computations of the uh, radial wind speed. Um, however, this is still <laughs> there's still some kind of disagreement or debate as to which regime is, is fully appropriate, um, which I don't have time to get into now, but if anyone wants to talk about this in more detail, I'd be happy to do so later in the conference. But the key takeaway is that we must add some computation of radial spreading of the umbrella cloud to more closely uh, match the model simulations with what we see in the field. So another key parameter I just want to briefly highlight is it's very important the grain size distribution that we use. So on this slide, each panel is corresponding to a simulation that used a slightly different grain size distribution from the courses shown in panel A up here and the finest shown in panel E. And hopefully what you can see by comparing between these uh, different plots is that where we get deposition and the kind of breadth of the deposit is very sensitive to the grain size distribution that we used. So, so that's why it's a really key parameter and definitely requires some, some careful consideration when you're desi designing the grain size distribution used. However, I will just note that there is a big simplification in all of these models and model runs, which is that we actually artificially aggregate everything finer than 100 microns into coarser size classes. And that's because if we don't do this, <laughs> the model never predicts that that ash will fall out within the model domain. And that's because it's using Stokes settling to kind of understand where the ash falls out. But we actually know that um, Stokes settling isn't what drives the deposition of fine material. It's much more complicated. Um, however, this is a problem that exists uh, across a lot of different ash diffusion models, sorry, infection diffusion models, and it's just something that really requires further study to be able to accurately model where we see deposition. So to sum up the key results from this study, uh, we found that adding radial umbrella uh, spreading is really key in order to replicate the width of a magnitude 7 eruption uh, ash deposit, such as the Mazama eruption. Um, and also, it was really useful for this study that we found modern meteorology data, we were able to use that for these simulations. And this might not always be the case. For instance, much older eruptions, you might have different um, wind fields now as to what were, were occurring during the eruption. So that was a real benefit for using the Mazama deposit. Um, and finally, this diffusion coefficient we see, yet again, as found in previous studies, is really key to kind of matching the deposit to what we see on the ground. Um, but more importantly, as I said, was this radial umbrella cloud spreading. So to conclude this short talk, I'm just going to leave up some kind of food for thought and final thoughts, um, areas that I think still require further study. And I just want to say thank you very much for listening. I'm really looking forward to any feedback or questions that you may have come up with. Thank you.